In electronics, filters attenuate signals of unwanted frequencies and allow only those of interest to pass through. For example, when we tune up an old-fashioned music equalizer, it is possible to implement a filter in analog or digital form. In the case of an analog implementation, there are two options, a passive filter with resistors, capacitors and inductors, or an active filter using only op-amps, resistors and capacitors. On the other hand, in the case of digital filters, this can be implemented either by software or hardware. Analog filters are more efficient since they operate in continuous time. However, the implementation of digital filters, no matter if it is by software or hardware, is much more economical and flexible. Digital filters are divided into two types according to the terms of function, Finite Impulse Response FIR, and Infinite Impulse Response IIR. The result of an IIR filter depends on its current input and its previous input and outputs, while in case of an FIR filter, its output only depends on its current and past inputs. In this video, I will show you how to design an FIR filter using MATLAB, how to implement such a filter using a multiply accumulator unit, and how to test it using Simulink and ModelSim. Filters can perform functions for low pass, high pass, band pass, or band stop. In my case, I will design an elementary low pass filter, but first I have to define the sampling frequency. It will be 500 Hz. Thus, the Nyquist frequency is 250 Hz. That is one half of the sampling frequency. This Nyquist frequency is the highest that we can read at that sampling rate. The band pass goes from 0 to 10 Hz and therefore all frequencies above this range will be attenuated. Finally, we need to define the order of the filter. The higher this value, the filter response will be more similar to that one of the unideal filter. I type a script in MATLAB to get the filter coefficients. I use the FIR1 function, which only requires the order and the cutoff frequency for low-pass filters. The returned vector represents the coefficients of the transfer function numerator. Remember that this function is given in the discrete time domain, so each value represents a negative power of c. Moreover, the negative power of c means a time shifting in a function. I execute the script with an order of 8, and with the help of the fb2 command, I can see the frequency response of the resulting filter, as well as its phase graph input response, among others. However, the frequency response is horrible. If we try with a higher order, let's say 15, the response improves just a little bit, but with an order of 255, the filter response looks excellent. For my example, I will use a 31 order. If we rearrange the terms of the trans function, we can clear the filter output and write the equation as a sum of products. As mentioned before, the negative powers of C represent shifts in time and therefore, we can obtain the same function as a linear difference equation, where the variable k represents the current moment, k-1, the past sampling time, k-2, two instants of sampling before, etc. The above equation is straightforward to implement if we use a multiplier accumulator unit. This is a structure designed to implement digital filters and it is first in almost all digital signal controllers and of course some FPGAs too. The block diagram of the filter is as follows. First, a signal activates the output of the latch and this causes the counter to increase its count. This same signal also enables the registers to capture the samples of the input signal. The first one corresponds to x in time k, the next one x in time k means 1 and so on. The counter signal determines which sample and coefficient pass to the multiplier. Thus, with each value of the account, each coefficient is multiplied by its corresponding sample. These products are accumulated with the help of another and a register. When the count runs out, the countdown model emits a high pulse, which causes the last register to put the final result on its output and also cleans the latch so that it disables everything. The samples of the input signal are 16 bits wide, while the coefficients are given in a fixed point format 16.16. .16 that is 16 bits for the integer part and 16 bits for the fraction. Thus, the result of the multiplication has 48 bits. However, since this value is added with many others, 8 more bits are included to avoid a possible overflow. 
In total, the output is left with 56 bits, of which the first 16 correspond to the fraction. The description of the top level is quite simple but indeed also tedious. I start by describing the top level entity that I have called the dot filter. It has input for the set clock a signal called SYN, which is used to start process. This signal is called SDR in my blog's diagram. Also, another port for the input signal and one more for the output. At this point, I wanted to implement this filter by hardware, therefore I set to 16 bits the output, but I changed this value later. Now I include the components that I have created for other projects, such as the latch, dot register, counter, and the countdown model. Now it's time to create the filter multiplexer component, which also includes a standard logic vector array to store the samples of the input signal. Thus, when the LDR signal is activated, all the registers of the model take a sample from its input and depending on the SEL signal, the X out output takes the value of some of the input samples. Now, I include the latch, counter, and countdown model to the top level. We can simulate only these three components to verify that once the circuit starts, the counter changes its value, and when it reaches its maximum, the circuit is deactivated automatically. Next, I include the multiplexer previously created and a new component called coefficient drum. As the name implies, it is a read-only memory that stores filter coefficients. This step can be a little bit confusing because it is necessary to convert the decimal numbers to a binary with a fixed point format. In an Excel sheet, I enlist all the coefficients. In the second column, I multiply these factors by 2 to the power of 60. This later because I am considering 16 bits for the fraction part. In the third column, I remove the decimals and in the last one, I make the conversion to hexadecimal. I include this component to the top level and write statements of the arithmetic operations. It is possible to extend the bus width of the multiplication result manually, concatenating the most significant bit to a new signal or using the resize function. Finally, I include the load registers to store the partial results and the final result and it's over. Now, I have to prove that it works. The first test that I can do to validate my design is through the impulse response. I produce a pulse to occur every one microsecond in the sampling signal. We also make the input signal have a 1 in the first cycle and 0 the rest of time. The white out output should display the filter coefficients in the order in which they appear as shown in the Excel sheet. Now, I need to install model sim. It is possible to download the student version of this software from the mentor website. We just need to fill out a form with our personal information and a download link will be sent to our email. It is necessary to install the application and once finished, it will open a new browser window to request the license. From the MATLAB command window, we execute the vsim command to open the model sim. Once opened, I create a new library and compile the bhdl files that I have created previously. Now, in the model scene command window, I type ubsimolink and the name of the main entity. This changes the appearance of the graphical user interface and allows us to drag the signals from the top level to the waveforms window. Here, I type stimulus commands for the clock reset and for the sampling signal. I return to MATLAB and run Simulink. Next, I create a new blank file and add two sinusoidal signals, a sum block, an FIR digital filter block, a MOOC creator, and a scope to display the model signals. One of the sine waves has a frequency of 5 Hz and the other one of 50. In the filter block, I indicate that the filter coefficients are in the vector B. I simulate for 2 seconds and it is clear that the filter works as expected. We can see the sum of the signals, the 5 Hz signal and the filter output. The 50 Hz signal disappear. What follows is to copy the model, but this time I include the HDL co-simulation block. I open the block properties and insert the input and output signals together with the name of the top level entity. The output is sampled at 2 milliseconds and it has a fixed point format with 16 bits for the fraction. In the time scales tab, I configured that the second in Simulink also represents a second in model sim. Next, I include a serial order holder with the sampling time 2 milliseconds and two blocks for data conversion since MATLAB uses floating point numbers with double precision by default. Now, 
I'm ready to run the simulation. It is a very demanding process for my computer. It takes more than 20 minutes to simulate 46% of the total time. Zooming in on the signals, it is evident that they are very similar. However, that's very subjective. I need to know exactly how different they are. For that, I insert a subtraction block to get the difference between the MATLAB filter and mine. I also include a block to compute the RMS value of the error and another scope to display the signal. To start the simulation again with zero initial conditions, it is necessary to execute the command restart in model sim and reload the configuration stimulus for the reset clock and sampling signal. This time, I simulate just a second and get an RMS error value of around 4 units. Not bad. Additionally, I am also interested in knowing the pace of the filter signal. Zooming in on the output signal from my filter, I can see that the delay between the input and output is around 34 milliseconds. If the sine frequency is 5 Hz, then the pace is approximately 1 radian, which is congruent with the MATLAB pace graph when the frequency is 5 Hz or 0.02 for a normalized frequency. In conclusion, I can say that the co-simulation between MATLAB and ModelSim is a very efficient and cheap solution when you want to test a sophisticated design or when its failure, once implemented in hardware, could cause damage to the experiment. It's also worth notice that despite using a fixed point format, the HDL filter results are very similar to those obtained by MATLAB using double precision floating point. Again, I hope you liked this video and learned something useful. If so, share and stay tuned for new videos. Please stay home during these days and remember that engineering is for creating, not destroying.